is a fourth way. Sometimes you use one way, sometimes another. Sometimes you use them in combination. All right. Now, I previewed the film and the film strip. I know why I'm using them. The group knows why it's seeing the film. Shown the film, now what? Well, that depends. But in all cases, you must follow through. Now, in using the micrometer film, I followed up the showing like this. Well, what do we know now? I think it looks pretty easy. I didn't quite understand what he meant by the feel of the micrometer. Uh, what about measuring a round piece of stock? How do you know when the uh, mic is on the diameter? When you're checking the mic for accuracy, how can you tell the standard's correct? All right, those are good questions. Maybe this film strip will help us find the answer. Then I use the film strip to review and emphasize the high points in the film. The questions on the film strip developed a lot of discussion. Don't you think it'd be a good idea to test them right away? For instance, why not draw the symbol and scales on the blackboard to see if they can read them correctly? Yeah, good. That's all right. But I use the film strip. And look, here in the manual, several frames, you see, are test questions. Take frame eight, for instance. That's right, Thompson. 626,000. Now, here's another one. What's that reading, Miss Alexander? Now, remember, this is on a two-inch mark. One and 750,000. That's right. Now, let's review the part about inside measurement. Now, the thing to remember when reading this inside micrometer is that the numbers read backwards, so to speak. Chroma, can you explain why those numbers read from right to left? It was a good way to review the film. Gave everyone a chance to see if he could read the micrometer. You ever show the film the second time for review? You would. You might find there were points that were not clear at all. You might find them when you showed the film strip. You must remember, Richards, that there are no set ways of using visual aids. You've got to work out your own best way. Here's the sound check real quick. Check, check, check. Job. Can you guys hear me talking? Well, you do have to experiment a little. All these people are yes, interested in me talking about you uh, learn how to operate showing a the film projector. never an end in itself. What do you mean? I mean that the teaching doesn't end when the film does. That is when the teaching begins. You must follow through. By follow through, do you mean showing trainees actually how to use the machine? Right. In using visual aids to teach a skill, the most important part of the follow-up is the actual trial and practice. Here's what I did. Now, this really clinched the learning. Each one of these pieces had its exact width marked on it in thousands. I showed them in this way what was meant by feel. Their readings had to come out the same as the correct measurements marked on each piece. And by passing the different pieces around, they had practice on several different thicknesses. So I followed up by using pieces without the correct measurements given. Makes a lot of sense. I've been expecting too much from just showing the film. <laughs> well, film and film strip won't do the training job for you, Richard. But if you give them half a chance, you'll find them a tremendous help. It takes time, though, to use them right. Yes, it takes time to plan. But we found that after the planning's done, if, if they're used right, the whole training process is speeded up. Well, let's see. Have you got a list of the films we have here? Yes. Here's one. The 
manuals are on file here. And the films and film strip are in this cabinet. Any time you want to preview any of them, it's easy enough to arrange to use the conference room. In the meantime, I'd like to check this list against my trading schedule. A quick way to find out what's in a picture is to look through the manuals. And then if the film has in it what you want, preview the film and the film strip too. Then after seeing the film, make your plans for using it. When you know what's in the picture and what you want to put across, it's easy enough to figure how to prepare the trainees for seeing the film and how to get the most out of it. Finally, there's the follow-up. And the film strip can be used here, but remember, the film strip is only part of the follow-up. Then you'll get the hang of that and work out your own method as soon as you've used a few of these visual units. The manual gives you several suggestions, but then there are a lot of other ways and variations. Then there's another thing. You'll find that the films give you a real break. So you give the films a break. Keep the shades pulled down tight. Keep direct light off the screen. Get the equipment set up before the group comes in. Have both projectors set up, threaded and focused in advance. That will save time. And of course, arrange the seats so that nobody's head gets in the way of the picture, and so that everybody can see the screen. Thanks a lot, Murphy, for all the help you've given me. You know, you've talked so much about that micrometer today that I... I want to learn more about it myself. <laughs> Mind if I take this film with me? Not at all. Go ahead. That's fine. You better take the manual and the film strip so you can do a complete job. technical problem here where I don't know we can't hear here what you're hearing <laughs> so it's uh, it's weird uh, so I don't know what these guys were talking about um, and I think they were talking about projectors and the process the film itself was called using visual aids in training so it wasn't just about film it was also about um, using uh, film strips and using slides and all that. So, and surprisingly, this is not the film I thought it was. I, I have a note that says that this is an awesome film. I don't think this was an awesome film. I think that it looked really boring. <laughs> the film, the, the audio that I heard when I was looking on Facebook was pretty boring. So, anyways, hi everybody. I'm uh, Skip Alzheimer of AV Geeks. Um, tonight you notice you might notice that the lighting is different that it's more thought thought out <laughs> and smarter it's because I'm actually being recorded uh, for a documentary uh, about film collectors um, Peter Flynn is here from uh, Boston and Peter did you want to come around and and just make your face known there he is right there <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, now you moved everything. Oh boy, here we go. Um, so Peter has been here all day at the archive uh, filming me blather on about uh, educational films and why I do what I do and why it's important, you know, uh, the, the things that we tell ourselves to get through the day uh, and to justify the weird purchases that I've made over the years. Um, and he bought it, so I think I got a good convincing <laughs> ar argument. Um, but anyways... So one of the things, when he said he was going to be in town, I was like, hey, I'm going to do this streaming event. This is kind of part of my mission, part of the idea. It's not only just collecting these wretched films. 
uh, and these amazing films. But also, it's really about showing the films and sharing the films and maybe trying to come up with some sort of re relevancy about the films. Why are the films maybe interesting or important today? Uh, and, you know, not every film I show is going to be that way, but there's a lot of films that are still kind of interesting and important. Um, so, this is part of the mission. This is part of the deal, is showing the films to people, uh, making it as easy as possible for them to watch it. So, you know, I'm sure that some of you people are watching these on tablets or on phones. Maybe somebody's in the bathroom watching it. And, you know, that's a different experience than sitting in a theater or sitting in a classroom watching them. So I think it's an, in an interesting thing, you know. And this is being recorded on Facebook so people can watch it later. So, oh, that's what I'm going to start with. All right. Um, so in, in, in conjunction with this, oh, that's what that is. Okay, so I have another film that's called Operation and Care of a Bell and Howell Sound Projector. That's not the film that we just watched. So I'm going to thread this one up. Uh, so anyways, tonight's show is, is related a little bit to what I've been talking about all day with Peter, which is uh, about 16mm film and about using it as a teaching tool. And these films, uh, tonight's theme is how to be an AV geek. So these are films that were shown to people running projectors um, to tell them how to maintain the projectors, how important films are for the educational experience. Um, and, you know, it's educational film companies that made films about how to show educational films. So I always like the kind of the meta part of that. Uh, so this is an opportunity to totally geek out with just the educational aspect of, uh, you know, the nitty gritty of how to use a projector. And there's, so there's going to be a lot of stuff that's related to that, um, which I'm excited about. So thank you for joining. Uh, tell your friends. Um, Peter, when do you think people will be able to see your documentary? Uh, many years from now. Many years from now. All right. <laughs> well, maybe something uh, bizarre will happen to me where it'll be like, wow, isn't it ironic that Skip said that in that, do in that documentary? Because now, you know, that was he was killed by all those films that collapsed on him. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find a stupid Popeye cartoon, he he touched the wrong film and it collapsed on him and killed him dead. All right, so this next film, as I said, is uh, Operation in Care of the Bell and Howell Sound Projector. So this will answer all the questions that you had about how to keep one of those things running. I personally do not use Bell and Howell. I use Ikees, which are uh, Japanese uh, film projectors that were made up until the 90s. And... Um, I find that they're a lot easier to use. The auto load uh, projectors I do not trust. So there you go. This film was produced to aid projectionists and describes the proper use and essential care of the Bell & Howell Filmosound projector. The operation of all the Filmosound models is practically the same. With the projector placed on the projector stand opposite the screen, the two doors on the right side should be opened. Remove the power cord. Feed reel arm. Take up reel arm. And empty reel. Insert the feed reel arm into its socket at the top front of the projector case. Then insert the take up reel arm into its socket. The take up reel arm gears should be disengaged. Loop the two spring belts over the pulleys of both feed reel arm and take up reel arm. Be sure that the belts are not twisted. The mounted 8 inch speaker 
can be played in the case or can be removed from the projector case and placed on top of a table or a chair near the screen. Unwind the speaker cable and insert its jack into the socket of the amplifier panel marked single. With both power line and lamp switches off, the power cord may be plugged into the projector receptacle and a 110 volt AC wall socket. Open the small door in front of the projector lens, then turn the clutch control clockwise as far as possible. When the power line and lamp switches are turned on, a beam of light is projected onto the screen. The light image may be focused by rotating the lens. The image may be centered by adjusting the tilt knob at the front of the projector. Moving the projector forward or backward may be necessary to fill the screen with the image. Turn the lamp switch off and the power line switch off. Now place a reel of film on the front reel arm and press it onto the spindle until it locks in position. Place a take up reel on the rear arm spindle. To begin threading a film, first unwind about four feet of film. Slip it through the slot in the top of the projector case and pass it over the film roller. Then pass the film under the feed sprocket. The film will engage the sprocket teeth when the guard tab is pressed. Swing the gate lever upward to open the film gate. Place the film in the aperture channel and form the upper film loop by following the raised loop guide. Press the gate lever down to close the film gate. The lower film loop should also conform to the raised loop guide. The film is carried over the take-up sprocket. Lock the film. Next, pass the film under the upper stabilizer roller, around and under the sound drum, and under the lower stabilizer roller. The film is locked in the sound sprocket so that it fits snugly around the sound drum. Pass the film under the snubber roller, under the rear guide roller, and through the rear slot. Then the end of the film should be passed under and around the bottom of the take-up reel. By turning the clutch control counterclockwise, the hand setting knob may be used to test for proper threading. Return the clutch control to an extreme clockwise position. When showing sound films, turn on the amplifier switch. Make sure the forward reverse switch is in the forward position and that the sound silent switch is in the sound position. Turn the power line switch on, then the lamp switch on. Focus the picture by turning the lens. Then tighten the lens lock screw. Set the volume control and adjust the tone control. The framer knob can be adjusted to eliminate any frame lines that may appear. If the picture has advanced too far, you can reverse the motion of the projector. First, turn the volume control down. Stop the film by turning the clutch control counterclockwise. Turn the power line switch off. Set the forward reverse switch to the reverse position. Turn the power line switch on. Turn the clutch control clockwise, and now the projector is operating in reverse. For forward movement, turn the clutch control counterclockwise, turn the power line switch off, set the forward reverse switch to the forward position, turn the power line switch on, the clutch control clockwise, then the volume control up. When the picture has ended, turn the lamp switch off and the sound volume down. The remaining leader should completely pass through the projector before the power line switch is turned off. To rewind the film, first interchange the positions of the two reels.
Press the take-up lock lever in. Raise the spindle to engage the rewind gears. Lead the film from the full to the empty reel. Turn on the power line switch. Turn off the switch when all the film has been rewound. To show silent films, the sound silent switch should be at the silent position, and the amplifier switch should be off. Otherwise, the projection procedure is the same. We've seen how to operate the Bell and Howell projector. Let's now learn what care and cleaning should be given the projector. Pull out the projection lens and clean it with lens tissue when dusty. The condensers may be cleaned in a similar fashion. The film gate shoe should be cleaned before each showing. Pull it straight out by grasping the metal frame. The aperture and film channel may be cleaned by using a small cleaning brush. Only a clean, soft cloth should be used to wipe the highly polished film gate shoe. When the projector lamp is burned out, Replace it by first turning off both lamp and power line switches. Disconnect the power cord from the projector. Unscrew the cap at the bottom of the lamp house. The lamp will drop out. Insert the new lamp with the vertical tongue of the pre-alignment gauge toward the front of the projector. When the lamp settles in its proper position, replace the screw cap tightly. If the exciter lamp needs replacement, unscrew the thumb nut of the compartment cover. Press the lamp down and turn it counterclockwise. Put in a new lamp, reversing the procedure just followed. After wiping the lamp clean, replace the compartment cover. If the fuse needs replacement, first be sure the power cord is disconnected. To remove the fuse holder, turn it counterclockwise. Put in a new one ampere fuse and return the fuse holder by pressing it in and turning it clockwise. For proper lubrication, you should consult your instruction book. For repair beyond the material covered by this film, report to your supervisor. With proper care and operation, your Bell and Howell projector will give you years of outstanding service. Microphone. Report it to your supervisor. Um, I don't want to say that the films are going to get any more interesting than that because they might not. <laughs> um, these are awesome films. They are definitely for a, a niche audience, and so I appreciate uh, you guys joining me on this adventure. Um, let's see. So I'm getting cropped a little bit. I'm going to try to make it not so cropped. Try to squeeze it in a little bit. Yeah, actually, that's, huh, that's interesting. That's cropped there. Oh well, life. Uh, anyways, I'm back. Um, so that's how to operate a Bell & Howell sound projector.
Um, a film of sound, uh, something I would not run a film through. Um, although I know, I think, um, Jay Schwartz, who is a film collector, a uh, guy who screens stuff in, uh, in Philadelphia, I think he swears by his film of sound, um, which the rest of us collectors and screeners are like, why would you use that projector? Um, but that's the thing is, you know, you pick your projector and you, you learn it and you stick with it and you learn about all its idiosyncrasies and um, what weird sounds it makes and how to replace the bulb without burning your fingers so that you have these calluses where your finger pads have melted um, you know, during the screening. Um, or caught your hand in some sprocketed wheels. Uh, that has happened with me before. Um, I've had quite a few injuries related to... Uh, a projector not paying attention. Uh, I don't think I got hair caught in one, but um, I did get hair caught in a reel that was taking up when I had longer hair. Um, so it's a dangerous business being an AV geek. Dangerous business. So I know what you're saying is like, well, what if I have a Vulex projector? Uh, how do a Vulex 16? How do I use that? Well, you'll be happy to know that we'll have a projector. Uh, we'll have a uh, a film about that coming up very soon. It's more modern. This film is made by um, McGraw Hill and ultimately Centron Films, and it's about again meta uh, about how to to use a classroom film, basically teaching uh, a teacher and a student on how, what do they do to prepare a classroom and to prepare a film to be shown. So it's talking about the content, trying to figure out how it works, you know, how, how do you plan activities after you show it, uh, questions, papers, you know, it really is trying to make an educational film a, a tool, an educational tool to kind of uh, spur discussion and investigation to be like a jumping point. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of schools didn't use it that way. What they did is they just used it as a way to fill time because there was a substitute teacher. Um, so, you know, even though educational filmmakers really went the extra effort to make the films really truly educational and informational, it didn't necessarily mean that schools followed the direction. So this is uh, how to use classroom films. are dimmed, the projector is running, the classroom has become a setting for use of a very effective teaching tool, the classroom film. Yet what these young people learn, and how well they learn it, rests largely with how the film is used. It does work. We've constructed an electric motor from a few simple materials. Let's review what happens by looking at a diagram. Here is the permanent magnet. Like all magnets, it has a north pole and a south pole. Here's the block of iron with the coil of wire around it, an electromagnet. The coil of wire is attached to wires leading to a dry cell. When current starts to flow, the coil becomes an electromagnet with north and south poles. These poles of the electromagnet are attracted by the poles of the permanent magnet and the block of iron turns. If we reverse the direction of the current in the coil by changing the dry cell connections, 
the north and south poles in our electromagnet reverse. This puts two north poles together and two south poles together. Since like poles repel each other, the electromagnets until opposite poles are attracted to one another. If we add the automatic switch to our diagram, it will look like this. Now, if the wires are connected to the dry cell, the motor will continue to rotate in one direction. For a science class concerned with how an electric motor works, a classroom film has illustrated a complex process in simple, understandable terms. The film, as is often true, has proved itself an effective and valuable teaching aid. This is particularly true when the film has been carefully selected for content and when the students have been correctly prepared for viewing the film. Activities which follow the film are also important. Activities such as a post-film discussion. Now, can someone explain to me the function of one of the basic parts of the electric motor? Danny. Well, without that automatic switch, the part called the commutator, the motor wouldn't make a complete revolution. Do you all agree with Danny's statement? Uh, George. Yes, I do, because on the diagram you could see that the commutator reverses the current. If it didn't, the motor action would stop. All right, now. From what we've seen in the film and talked about, can someone give me the definition of a commutator? Sharon, give me your definition. A commutator is a device for reversing the direction of a current. The film has been used to convey information and to stimulate deductive thinking. This kind of discussion of content is as much a part of using a film as the actual showing of it. For a film, however good it may be, is still only a teaching tool and depends for its greatest effectiveness on how it is used by the teacher. Effective use of a film begins days, perhaps even weeks, prior to the showing, when the teacher selects the film. The director of her local instructional material center can often provide helpful advice about which of several films in the same subject area will best suit the teacher's purpose. Of course, one may have to rely on the resume in a catalog to determine a film's content as well as its running time. The important thing at this point is that selection is not a hit or miss affair, but keyed to a lesson plan and made on the basis of the best information available about a film. The next step you as the teacher take in using a film is to become familiar with it yourself. If the film is available to you for only a short time, you may have to limit your own preparation to studying the teacher's guide for the film if it is available. Here you will find usually a more complete description of the film's content than is possible in a catalog or file, along with the questions you may want to ask following the showing of the film. Comments from previous users of a particular film, if they are available, are also helpful. An ideal way to study a film and prepare to use it with your class is to preview it, with pencil in hand, taking notes as the film progresses. It can be a real help to have one or more of your students in the preview room with you. As they watch from a viewpoint which is different from yours, they will detect new or unusual words or situations which may require explanation before the film is shown to the group. They may also reveal interests a teacher may use to motivate the entire class. Well, Billy, was there anything you didn't understand? Well, I don't understand why the farmers and cattlemen had to fight so much. Why couldn't the farmers just settle and plant their crops in the areas where the cattlemen were located? Mm -hmm. How about you, Mary? Any words you didn't understand? Well, blooded something. Blooded stock, I think it was. Creative teachers have many ways of developing class readiness for seeing a film. Preparation often starts the day before. Unusual words may be defined beforehand. You recall that yesterday we talked about the problems of settling this large area of our country known as the Great Plains. Today we're going to see a film that shows us those problems very clearly. Of course, when the Great Plains were being settled in the 1850s and 1860s, the movie camera had not yet been invented. So in this film, we get the story as we look at famous paintings and drawings made by artists who were there at the time. Now, Kathy, do you recall the problem about the Plains area that we discussed yesterday? 
Well, there was constant fighting between ranchers and farmers over the use of land, so neither of them could become really prosperous. And we decided that this situation kept many people away who might otherwise have come and helped to settle the Great Plains. Yes. Very good summary, Kathy. Now, in this film, we're going to learn about some other problems that faced these people and what they finally did about them. Afterwards, I want you to be able to identify and discuss the problems and to describe how the eventual solution of these problems affected our country's history. All right, let's have the film. It wasn't like the days when cowboys fought Indians. Between cattlemen and farmers, nobody had the what for to make the difference. Both had six shooters, and both could use them. Peace depended, it seemed, on finding a cheap and practical fence. Some tried a thorny hedge, the Osi's orange for fencing. And it was pig tight, horse high, and bull strong. But it took four years and more to grow. Others tried just plain old wire, but cattle shoved right through it. And the search continued. The search for a fence that would combine the low cost of wire with the thorns of a hedge. Joseph Farwell Glidden, a 60-year-old farmer, was granted a patent for a barbed fence wire that worked. The following year, Jacob Hayes received a patent for his improved S-barb steel fence wire. Both methods were practical and inexpensive. The West got its fencing. But the new fences blocked off the cattle trails to the railroads. And there were some who resisted the changes on the plains brought about by barbed wire. Some fenced off water holes, forcing others to become fence cutters. But the bark of six shooters diminished. Laws were passed to protect both sides. And in time, barbed wire turned out to be a blessing to the cattlemen, too. They had built their industry on the native Texas longhorn, a tough, mean, ornery critter, as tough on the table as he was on the range. With barbed wire fencing, the cattlemen could separate their herds, introduce blooded stock, and supply the demand for better beef. Soon the Great Plains became a new land. The railroad, the Colt Revolver, the artesian well, the windmill, new ways of farming dry land, and, of course, barbed wire, enabled our country to settle a vast interior, to turn what was once the great American desert into rich, fertile farmland. Who can give me some reasons why the invention of barbed wire was so important to the development of the Great Plains? Jimmy? Well, the barbed wire helped both farmers and cattlemen because they could keep the cattle where they were supposed to be, and the farmers could do more farming and less fighting. Yes, and this was the only kind of wire fencing ever invented that could do the job, wasn't it? Why didn't they build wooden fences? Karen? There wasn't any wood. Yes, that's right, Karen. Now I think it might be interesting to find out why there was no wood available in the Great Plains area. This will take some research. So Karen, you, Betty, Tom, and Alan prepare a report on this. We're all going to spend some time reporting on other aspects of this subject, too. Who would like to find out more about the benefits the barbed wire fencing made possible for the cattlemen? Bob? Well, I recall the film mentioned something about separating the herds and introducing blooded stock. I'd like to know more about this. Okay, Bob. You team up with George, Bessie, Elaine, and Frank on that question. There are many ways to conduct post-film activities profitably. The objective should always be to use the film as a springboard to learning, understanding, and creating. Assigning a research project on a topic related to the film will help the student to form relations of ideas, concepts, and facts, and thereby provide creative learning experiences. In any review of effective use of classroom films, we should not overlook the importance of physical details. For example, proper arrangements for seating, lighting, ventilation, and placement of equipment.
Also, if you plan to run the film yourself, check ahead of time to make sure you are familiar with the projector and its operation, how to thread it, and how to operate the controls. Where these details are handled by a student projectionist, it is still important for you to make sure that these arrangements are made beforehand. All these physical details may contribute or detract from the showing, and hence, they are relevant to the creative use you make of a film as a teaching tool. Remember also that since using a film is part of a creative process, the steps you take reflect your own creative ability. The first point at which you put your creativity to work is in the selection of the film, choosing it for your purposes on the basis of your evaluation of it for the effectiveness with your students. The second point is the key to all the steps following it, your own preparation for showing the film. This is the point where you decide whether you will show the film all at one sitting or use only an excerpt which applies to the particular topic being studied. It is the point at which you make final plans for how to use this teaching tool. At the third point, class motivation, you develop readiness for viewing the film. This may be a simple procedure of telling your students the title of the film, why they are seeing it, and some idea of what they are expected to learn from it. Or it may be as elaborate as using other teaching techniques over several periods leading up to the showing. Point four, the showing of the film, when the creative process is seemingly out of your hands, still reflects your guiding role, particularly if you decide to repeat the showing of the film or to shut off the projector at a certain spot for a predetermined reason. At point five, the creative teaching aspect comes into full play, for student participation includes all the follow-up activities which round out your film, discussion, testing for content, research work, report writing, problem, any or all of these post-film activities of are your contribution. And it is your contribution which is the single most important factor in using a classroom film. <laughs> So, you learned a lot more about barbed wire than you thought you were going to, didn't you? It was fascinating. Um, so, you know, this of course is where the idea of the AV geek, the kid who's running the projectors, is it called the AV geek? Um, this space here, that, that AV um, library, that is beautiful. And at some point, if I ever move from this uh, boarding house slash archive, to a real space, you better believe I'm gonna call in some designers to recreate that awesome logo and the, the, the crazy kind of shape. Um, I might have to paint an entire warehouse white just to accommodate that, but um, very much, that would be a place I would love to work, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, so this was the, this is the idea. This was made by Centron, uh, who was an educational film company. McGraw-Hill distributed it. Um, and they were both making a bunch of money making and distributing educational films. So, of course, you want to uh, have a film that actually uh, talks about how to use them efficiently and correctly. Um, try to guarantee success in future sales. Uh, some people don't remember this, but most of these films, the vast majority of these films were made by companies that were making a buck. They did this for money. Uh, some of them had a, a little bit higher purpose, maybe, but it was mostly about, like, we're making this so we can sell them to schools and to universities and community colleges and wherever. Um, this wasn't because, this wasn't government funded. Um, although that first film that we watched, the one about um, correct, proper use of visual aids, uh, that one was made for the government, but it was made by a company that did it for, for money. Oh, here I am.
Next film is, uh, this might be another Centron film. It's, uh, Centron was uh, based in Kansas, Lawrenceville, Kansas. And uh, so consequently, if you actually hear them mic uh, actors and students, they have a little twang to their voice. Um, but of the some of the major educational film companies, of which I would say Cornet, Encyclopedia Britannica, um, Centron, and there's others, of course, ones in California and things like that. Um, I like Centron the most because they have the most heart. They did a lot of interesting social guidance films that were very progressive and thoughtful and written by a woman, Trudy Travis. So, um, pr great stuff. The Encyclopedia Britannica was pretty dry until the 70s, and then they, they took a bunch of acid or something and went crazy. Um, Centron was, or uh, Coronet, which is also based in Chicago, like Encyclopedia Britannica, they tended to be also more conservative. Even though they were progressive in their message, they were very conservative. They wouldn't let kids use slang. Uh, everybody had to have pretty good grammar when they spoke. Um, so anyways, this is uh, Facts About Projection. And this film, I think, was made in 1959. So enjoy. in education that only carefully planned instruction produces maximum learning. Planning is especially necessary to achieve maximum educational value for motion pictures. This means proper study and discussion of the material in advance of screening and a follow-up of planned related activities. The careful use of films in religious education, just as in our schools, speeds up the learning process and provides more learning in less time. Industry, too, has learned that planned use of films is one of the most effective methods of communicating ideas and teaching specific skills. To show films, there are a number of excellent and easy-to-operate motion picture projectors available. There are minor differences in the operation of these projectors, such as the method for threading the film, replacing the projector lamp, cleaning the film gate, the location of the speaker, or rewinding. However, all motion picture projectors operate on the same basic principles. A sound understanding of these principles will provide a basis for operating any type of 16 millimeter projector. A typical motion picture projector consists of two sections, each with a different function. The picture section, which projects the picture from the film to the screen, and the sound section, which reproduces or recreates the sounds which have been recorded on the film soundtrack. As the film moves through the projector, it first enters the picture section. This section consists of the projection lamp, which is a very bright light source. This light is concentrated on a single frame of the film by a condenser lens. The brilliantly illuminated frame of the film is projected by the projection lens onto the screen. The lens is moved to focus the picture. As the film moves through the picture section, it pauses on each frame. 
In a sound projector, this happens 24 times a second. Next, the film enters the sound section. Here, an exciter lamp passes light through the soundtrack area of the film. This light is received by the photocell. Sound waves, which have been recorded as variations of light and dark areas on this film, cause the light beam reaching the photocell to vary in brightness. When the film moves, the photocell produces electrical pulsations corresponding to the original sound. which are then amplified and fed to the speaker. In contrast to the picture section, the film in the sound section must move smoothly and at a constant speed. Some motion picture projectors are equipped to record and reproduce magnetic sound. This magnetic soundtrack coating often uses only part of the optical soundtrack area, making it possible to use either optical or magnetic sound on the same film. In the school, the most effective use of films takes place in the classroom with its work-study atmosphere. The class has already prepared work on the subject, and before seeing the film, there is discussion of the new ideas and words that will be used. The teacher, having read the film guide and having reviewed the film, often leads the class in the discussion. Now they are ready for the film. Smooth professional projection and the integration of the film with the workaday atmosphere of the classroom greatly enhances effectiveness in learning. But to achieve this professional screening, there had to be proper preparation. Preparation in advance is the key to good projection. In the majority of schools, audiovisual equipment and the films themselves are kept in a central location. Here, under supervision, the films are checked and, if necessary, repaired, and the equipment is maintained. Much of the preparation behind good film use is in training operators in the principles of projection and in maintenance of the equipment. Some projectors are equipped with sealed, long-lasting oil reservoirs and seldom need oiling. But most projectors require regular lubrication. The oil should be placed only in the proper holes or cups. And any overflow carefully wiped away. It's the same idea as lubricating one's automobile at regular intervals. This preventive maintenance protects gears and moving parts from excessive wear. If the windshield is dirty, only a blurred image is seen. A special fluid and paper are used to give a crystal clear view. Just so in cleaning the lenses of a projector. Remove grit and brush gently with a soft brush. Use a drop of lens cleaner. Then dry using a circular motion with lens cleaning paper. A dirty lens projects a scene like this. Clean it and you have this. This fuzz around the edge of the picture area is dirt in the aperture. 
It is not only disturbing to see, but it can scratch the film. It may be removed easily with a brush. The sound projector sprocket wheels have sprockets or teeth only on one side. Sound films have sprocket holes on only one side. The soundtrack is on the other side. To reduce strain on the film during projection, the film is threaded with loops above and below the gate. These loops serve as shock absorbers. Correct loop size is usually indicated on the projector. If loops are too large, they will slap about. If they're too short, they may tear the film. About 95% of film damage happens in the first 20 feet. The lower loop must always be the correct size and the film must fit snugly over the sound drum in order for the sound to be synchronized with the picture. This is because the sound is recorded exactly 26 frames in advance of the picture. Properly threaded film appears like this on the screen. The movement of my lips is synchronized with the soundtrack. However, if the lower loop is too short, the voice will be heard like this in advance of its picture, and the two will not be synchronized. And if the loop is too long, the voice, as you hear it now, will lag behind the corresponding picture and will again be out of synchronization. If at any time the film should break in the projector, do not patch it with tape or anything else. Simply overlap and continue winding so that later on, at the film library, the break will be found and repaired. Not only is understanding the technical operation and maintenance of equipment important, but knowledge of proper projection setups covering varied situations is equally necessary. The screen should be set up at the front of the room so that everyone can easily see it. The screen should be placed at least two screen widths in front of the first row. The bottom of the screen should be level with the tops of the heads of those in the front row. If a room can be adequately darkened, or if chairs are permanently fixed to the floor, the screen should be placed at the front and center of the class. Some rooms are difficult to darken. If this is the case, it is best to place the screen diagonally in the corner of the room by the windows. In rooms extremely difficult to darken, a lenticular screen placed in this position is most helpful. To ensure a smooth running operation, a supply of extra projection lamps Exciter lamps, fuses, and belts should be on hand. It's always a good idea to check the film before taking it to the room where it will be shown. One way to do this is by placing the reel on the projector. If the film is mounted on the reel properly, it should fit on the arm so that it runs clockwise. When held in this position, the title should read correctly. When the projector is started, you won't have this or this. The picture will be right side up and in the proper position. All films that are to be projected should be checked in advance. With much of the preliminary preparation done in the audiovisual or equipment room, where supervision and the necessary equipment and supplies are available, the final setup in the classroom can be made. This time, the projectionist is able to set up the equipment before the class has assembled. Often the setup must be made while the class is in session. The screen is placed directly in front of the projector and raised to the proper height. The projector is then assembled. The 
power cord is twisted around the leg of the stand to prevent the projector from being tipped over if the cord is accidentally pulled. If an extension cord is used, it should be secured by a knot. If the sound fails to operate, it may be because the plug is reversed in the outlet. The projector is ready for a trial run. The motor is turned on, then the lamp. If the image is too large for the screen, the projector must be moved closer. And of course, the reverse is also true. For the best sound, the speaker should be placed off the floor and near the screen. The speaker cord is secured in the same manner as the power cord. In a few moments, the amplifier will warm up and a hiss will be heard to indicate that the sound system is working. Testing with a card is a double check on the sound system. By leaving the cans open at the start, the changes of reels can be made quickly. It's always a good practice, if time permits, to actually view the beginning of the film in order to check the focus, the framing, and the volume. When the classroom is filled with students, the volume may have to be turned higher. A signal from the teacher and the screening is started. Preparation in advance is the key to good projection. It will result in a smooth screening of the film, and this in turn will provide an opportunity for maximum learning. So that was the International Film Board. I was wrong. It wasn't Centron. I, I thought for sure it was. Um, please forgive me. So I have um, facts about projection. Third edition. It was made in 1975. And uh, I watched it earlier with Peter. And uh, so it was the exact same film, except that... In the 70s, it was more diverse. So you had um, girls operate, operating the projection. Uh, you had African Americans. So there was it was definitely a nod to what was happening as far as films, um, who was showing up in films doing things. Um, it wasn't just a bunch of white dudes, white boys. Um, but the animations were the same, and that cool little classroom diorama that was where you set the screen. Again, that's really awesome. I would love, love to uh, have that too, that visual aid. Um, so yeah, that's how you do, uh, how you prepare to show films. I, what I also like about this is how the, uh, the guy tied the power cord and the sound cord to the AV cart, which I probably could learn a lesson from that. Um, 
being very clumsy, I walk like a cartoon character. I have often snagged my foot on a, uh, a cord and have almost lost a projector, pulling a projector off of the stand. Uh, so um, that's a pretty smart thing to do. <laughs> I should say for the record, I don't actually have a rolling AV cart. I don't want one, so don't give me one. But uh, I don't have one as of yet. Um, when the Alamo Draft House opens uh, nearby, I will uh, probably acquire one so that we can put stuff on that AV cart. Um, probably video. Because so we're going to be showing uh, VHS tapes on a big screen. And so maybe we'll, we'll use an AV cart for that. All right. What else we got here? I know, I know. You people have been clamoring in the comments, um, especially on Twitch, that you wanted to learn how to use the Vulex projector. I know that some of you have purchased a Vulex projector on eBay, and you were desperately trying to figure out how to use it. Well, you're in luck. This is the brand new uh, Vulex projector, introduced in a brand new model, and it shows you. What's awesome about it, it's a really awesome projector. So um, you can shut up about it. I don't own any Vulex. I own some Graflex, which is uh, Singer. The sewing machine, sewing machine manufacturer made projectors for a while. Um, but not any Vulex. Also, there's some dude on eBay selling uh, 16 millimeter projectors from the Ukraine, from Russia, and the, those Soviet projectors look awesome. But I mean, you have to pay like $200 for shipping, <laughs> so it's not worth. My, uh, I was telling uh, Peter that for me, I certainly like the equipment. I certainly like geek out on the equipment, but really for me, it's about the content. So I'm not gonna go out and buy cool looking projector just to have it like I it's got to be functional for me so that's uh, some collectors it's opposite they love the projection equipment themselves Dino Everett is the I, I think he's the rock star of uh, the film archivist world because he collects so many strange formats uh, gets them up and running and then shows them he, he is fearless he has no fear in showing a hundred year old film of a weird arcane format um, so I, he very much has my respect, but we totally disagree, disagree as far as sharing the content. Like, I think it's important to get it out there in the world in lots of different ways, and he feels like, you know, if he had his druthers, it would be only shown on film. So we discuss that um, often. So this next film, as I said, The Vulex Projector. Enjoy. This is the age of electronic push-button controls. From large industrial marvels to the smallest pocket calculator, electronic microcircuitry makes things happen with the speed of light, quietly and reliably. 16 millimeter sound projectors are still in the pre-electronic age, like this outdated adding machine. Mechanically complicated, inefficient, difficult to service. For instance, most popular automatic threading projectors leave much to be desired when film jams in their involved threading mechanisms. They're not
not so simple to use or trouble-free when film must be unthreaded to correct a jam or when removed mid-reel. Many times, film is further damaged by this excessive handling. Some projectors still use difficult to service and cumbersome designs that haven't been changed in years. These old fashioned spring belts, for example, are exposed, easy to damage, and potentially hazardous. Even slot loaders present problems, with your film bearing the brunt of it. The fact is that up to now, all 16 millimeter sound projectors have been just about the same. But now, with today's technology for today's needs, 16 millimeter projection enters the space age with the Vulex System 16 touch button projector. With totally new electronic control for ease of operation, for consistently reliable performance, for more effective communication, each feature is user oriented, engineered to satisfy user preferences touch button operation, total remote control, all modular design, automatic and manual film threading, crisp, brilliant pictures with lifelike, room-filling sound. Ulex, System 16. Simply touch a button. System 16 is energized. Control console illuminated. Independent cooling system in operation. Touch forward. Each button light brightens when activated. Then the gentle, reliable, automatic System 16 takes over. The System 16 offers unparalleled versatility with touch button and slider controls at the projector or at any distance away from it. This compact remote control duplicates the projector console in the palm of your hand. We call it Command Pack. System 16 is the only projector that offers total remote operation from anywhere you choose. Just plug in command pack, then power on. Forward. Lamp on. Even stop on frame and reverse. Touch once to change direction, another touch to run. Everything the electronic way, without damage to film or projector. Let's continue. Press forward on the projector console. By simply touching the jog button for stop on frame, motion freezes. You can study and discuss specific scenes. The image on the screen always remains in focus. Discuss for as long as you like. Jog for detailed frame-by-frame -frame analysis in forward or reverse. Just touch and hold for automatic scanning at one quarter normal projector speed. Fleeting details are magnificently revealed under the scrutiny of jog and stop on frame. And when you're ready to continue, touch forward again. Even sound volume can be controlled via command pack. Many other exclusive features make System 16 the only years ahead 16 millimeter projector. The safe threader has no moving parts, never requires adjustment. Its operation is foolproof. Just release the lock and push it in. Touch for power and start. The safe threader guides the leader through the projector. Then the threader is moved completely out of the film path so that film contact points are kept to a minimum. And to remove the film at any time, even in mid-reel, simply slide out the safe threader. The swing-out lens gate and uncluttered film path make unthreading a snap. 
The film is so readily accessible, there's no danger of damage due to its mishandling, even when removing film from the sprockets. There's less film wear in a clean projector, so easy access makes routine cleaning much simpler. With System 16, it's not necessary to remove parts, as it is with some slot-loading projectors. If you choose to thread manually, it only takes a few moments. An extra long aperture plate and guide rails position the film accurately and conveniently. The oversized threading guides are permanently outlined on the projector and easy to follow. And spring-loaded sprocket shoes lock into position securely. Rack and pinion lens focusing is precise and rapid. And a convenient lens lock assures constant focus. For reduced film wear, System 16 is the projector with the least number of film contact points, just eight, while the number of contact points on other projectors ranges from 14 for an Aki to 18 for a Bell & Howell. We call it feather touch film handling. This poorly made masking tape splice shows how System 16's design permits trouble-free operation. Here we're cutting off four perforations to demonstrate how System 16's three-tooth shuttle and automatic loop restorer will ease most damaged film through the projector without having to stop. Tape splices, staple splices, torn perforations, all are easily handled. The automatic loop restorer works quickly and positively. The System 16 rewinds film at high speed without changing reel positions. Flip up the quick rewind lever and press the reverse button. Nothing touches rapidly moving and vulnerable film surfaces. With in-path rewinding on slot loading projectors, fast moving film is exposed to the internal projector mechanism and is subject to damage. An energy saving 200 watt tungsten halogen lamp provides whiter and brighter light with lower operating cost. The lamp is completely accessible, easy to replace. By simply pushing a button, up to four times the rated lamp life may be obtained. For extra film and projector protection, the cooling system uses a separate motor that operates constantly when the projector is switched on. Vulex offers numerous important extras. Many unique features make System 16 more useful and convenient. Fingertip sliding tone and volume controls. A separate microphone input. And an independent microphone volume control. Using a microphone in combination with Command Pack's remote control is perfect for individualized film narration. You have a choice of sound or silent speeds. The change is affected electronically by changing the speed of the drive motor. No belt shifting, no complications. An external speaker jack. A geared tilt control operates rapidly and won't slip and storage space within the projector for an 800-foot reel. There's a System 16 for anywhere in the world. Models ranging from 100 to 240 volts, 50 and 60 hertz. 
Here's the inside story of System 16's superiority through modularity. Twelve modules, each crafted for high reliability. The Vulex System 16 puts them all together for superior performance and takes them all apart for superior serviceability. We call it AccuBlock, System 16's unequaled 100% modular construction. Easy to service, with minimum downtime, and at low cost. After individual parts are checked carefully for quality and conformity to specifications, they are assembled into a module. Each module is then thoroughly tested as a functioning unit. This is AccuBlock dependability. For AccuBlock serviceability, all modules are easy to replace. Here, the color-coded wires of the power processor are unplugged after four screws are removed. The replacement module takes only minutes to install. This is the rugged 20-watt amplifier and electronic control module. Its integrated, solid-state, flat-pack circuitry replaces 70% of the noisy mechanical parts of non-System 16 projectors. All connections and circuit boards quickly unplug. A screwdriver is the only tool required to replace any electronic module. This is the master board, the electronic heart of the projector. With competitive projectors, the film shuttle mechanism is the most time-consuming and expensive to service. Here's why. To repair this critical area in a Belvin Howell, this is the disassembly required. However, with System 16, just replace the projection module. It takes less than 10 minutes. Remove four screws. Disengage the motor drive belt and unplug four wires. The projection module is then lifted out of the projector. It includes the entire intermittent film drive mechanism. For example, here's the three-tooth shuttle. The removed projection module may be serviced by your own technician. However, to benefit from System 16's minimum out-of-service time feature, a module kit will supply a working module for immediate replacement. The inoperative one is then returned to Vulex for exchange with a factory fresh replacement at once so that your module kit inventory remains constant and always ready for use. It all adds up. With AccuBlock modular design, the Vulex System 16 does more, does it better, and does it for longer. With touch button operation, with total remote control, with all its unique and useful features, this 16 millimeter projector of the future, ready for today's communications needs, is right in the palm of your hand. Try it. I gotta tell you, that was awesome. <laughs> that was really, I mean, I'm sold. If uh, if these if there were a bunch of these available for sale, I would snap one up. But um, there's not many out there, so I don't know how successful this really was. I certainly have a couple of Ulex film strip projectors, but this, you know, this is a bunch of designers got together and thought about, all right. How can we take on Ike and Elmo and Bell and Howell 
and and really um, make a quality product. And on you know on film it looks great, but I don't know you know what failed. <laughs> It probably just didn't have the distribution or, you know, maybe the manufacturing wasn't good or it, they just didn't get adopted. Like you didn't have a sales force that pushed it out there because Bell & Howell is, is everywhere. Um, even their brand name lives on after, uh, I don't know if you ever go to, uh, you've seen the commercials, the as seen on TV commercials with, for the Bell & Howell flashlight, the Bell & Howell security light, you know, a name that you can trust, Bell & Howell. It's like, wow, that's what somebody b bought that name and they now are just putting it on various junk things. Although I would love to actually use one of those Bell & Howell new flashlights and see if I could power and use that as a projection lamp for an old Bell & Howell projector, just to see. I think it'd be funny. Um, but these, uh, the Vulex, man, it's the future. Um, but, you know, it didn't survive. All right. I've been talking about film all day, and I'm almost spent. But I've got one more film for you uh, tonight, which is uh, it's a British film. And it's – I love it. I love showing it. And I actually showed it uh, – at a, at, did a screening of it and showed it. Because it's a film about proper projection. And so I made a joke about it. And that was one of the worst projection nights I've ever had. The projector just did not behave. The film did not behave. It was a nightmare. <laughs> I don't know exactly. I think I, I angered the projection god or something uh, that night. But this film is called Project the Right Image. And... Uh, Peter's from the UK, and I'm hoping, because this film is from the UK, that he can identify uh, some of the people in this as actors that were on TV or in film. And so it's intentionally fun. Uh, I should say while I'm threading, um, thanks everybody for watching. Uh, it always means a lot to be able to show uh, these films to folks like you. Some of you I know, a lot of you I know, um, but new people, that's always great. Uh, we do this once a month. Uh, the next screening is going to be March 11th. And I haven't decided what I'm going to show yet, so um, follow me, follow 80 Geeks or follow S Skip Alzheimer on Facebook or uh, just kind of stay tuned. Uh, I'll pick a topic. I'm thinking right now motorcycles, so I just need to make sure I have enough motorcycle fodder. Um, mostly motorcycle safety films, um, but maybe I'll sneak something else in there too. Um, the other thing I should mention is that God, it's, the, it's like the worst mirror ever. Um, you can donate to the AV Geeks via Patreon. Uh, Patreon is a kind of a, a tip jar subscription thing where you can donate a couple of bucks a month, and that um, what that does is I get a payment every month where. I can spend it on buying um, supplies for the Telecine setup, hard drives. Uh, we tried to buy a webcam, but it was a piece of crap. Um, but we'll, you know, eventually we're going to start trying to upgrade different pieces of equipment so we have better ways to, to project uh, and get you to see what you're watching. So it's investing in the AV Geeks, and it's much appreciated, so thank you. Another way you can support us is just go to avgeeks.com and just watch videos that we have there go to our youtube channel and just watch those videos uh share them tell your friends uh, it's a lot of fun uh if you're in the raleigh area i'm doing a screening on tuesday um called the vd after vd so it's v vd films um i just pulled a bunch of them and i i only picked ones that have really great songs about venereal disease in them um so that's uh, tuesday night at king's which is in downtown raleigh uh, at doors open at 7:30, starts at eight o'clock. Five dollars is a suggested donation. It's a lot of fun. So come on down and see that if you're around. Uh, and I've got more stuff coming up in March, which I just can't remember. But um, yeah, uh, thanks again for coming and watching. And uh, we'll watch Project the Right Image.
it'll be great. Enjoy. Meet St. Matthews. It's 60 years since the first motion picture, but at St. Matthews they like to uh, leave things for a bit to see if they'll catch on. Tonight, convinced that the movies are here to stay, the church is putting on a film. Meet Matthew. No, not, not the saint, but Matthew Sprocket, the projectionist. He also likes to leave things for a bit. Uh, so much so, in fact, that tonight he's late already. Between them, he and St. Matthews have much to learn. If you could uh, take your seats, please. Um, there are some empty ones down the front here. Yes. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or perhaps I should say um, friends. May I first of all welcome all of you uh, to what perhaps is a rather uh, momentous occasion in the life of St. Matthews, for tonight we are to have a film show. And I do feel that in this um, day and age, this whole matter of communication is extremely important. We Christians need to be prepared to um, communicate with, uh, to communicate with communications. 
and we need to do this constantly. But, uh, as I've said, I are going to have a film. Now, I, I realize that perhaps a film is quite a novelty. It might be when I was a, a younger man. Uh, I must say, the cinema has been with us now for quite a number of years, and perhaps I should confess that occasionally I visit it myself, although I could really be described as a um, film fan. But uh, nowadays, it is not only in the cinema. It is in our own homes that we have not only radio, but moving pictures as well in the shape of television. And you have come here to see a film. And it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce you to our very able, not to say talented projectionist, Mr. Matthew Sprocket. <laughs> and he is going to uh, project our film for us. And I am sure that this will be an experience which none of us will ever forget. <laughs> dear friends, patience, we live. We live in a technological age, and I suppose in a time like this we must expect the occasional spanner in the works, but I'm sure Mr. Sprocket will soon manage to remove this particular spanner. Um, I, I do feel that it is very important that the church should uh, keep abreast of the times, and that it should never allow its members to relax into its bosom, but that it should uh, push them out into the hurly-burly of life's rich pageant. Uh, oh, I, uh, sorry, well, well uh, the point is that we are all in the dark, and we are all seeking, seeking the light. Uh, are you ready now, Mr. Sprocket? said, never forget. So, let's start again from the beginning and see how it might be done. Learning to show films efficiently isn't very difficult, but there are perhaps ten basic commandments. First, make sure that your publicity is as attractive and informative as possible. And second, early preparation is essential. This means that the projectionist must be there in good time, the hall must be prepared well in advance, and this includes adequate blackout when necessary. It's a good idea to have stewards in the hall earlier to help the projectionist, and in particular to control the house lights. Third, the projectionist should make sure he has all the things he'll need. A proper projection stand, tall enough to clear people's heads, spare bulbs, adapters for plugs, an extension lead for the mains cable, spare spools, brushes to clean the projector, and fuses. Commandment four. 
Put the screen where everyone can see it and place the, the loudspeaker as high as possible to left or right of the screen and facing diagonally across the room. Since you have a mains extension cable, you'll always be able to align the projector correctly with the screen, however far away the main socket may be. Five. Using the brush you've brought, clean the film path, the lens, and, most important, the sound optics. A small piece of dirt can permanently damage a film. Six. Before lacing up the film, switch on the projector and focus the white light on the screen. If necessary, adjust the position of the projector. This should be the last time white light is seen on the screen. Turn on the amplifier and set tone and volume controls to a midway position. Test that the sound system is working by moving the lens brush in front of the exciter lamp. Then lace up the film. This is a projector with automatic threading, which makes lacing easy. However, it is vital to check that the leader is in good condition with no torn sprockets. Whatever the projector, follow the instructions. Advance the film to where the numbers start and turn down the volume. And you are now ready to start showing the film. Good evening. May I welcome all of you to St. Matthews. Tonight we have a new venture, which is a film called Followers of the Sun. Commandment 7. Make sure that whoever does the introduction to the film is clear and to the point. Lively discussion afterwards. Thank you. 8. The correct starting sequence is important. Switch on the projector motor, not the lamp, and watch the numbers on the leader as they go into the projector. At number three, turn out the house lights, turn on the lamp, and fade up sound. Focus the film and adjust the framing and tone controls if necessary. Now, just before we leave Matthew and St. Matthews, let's go over these points once again. First, always have good publicity. Second, always be punctual, arriving in good time. Third, Preparation is vitally important. Try and think of everything you may need. Fourth, see that your projector, screen, and loudspeaker are in the correct position. Five, take care to clean the film path. Six, preset the film and projector controls so that you're ready to start immediately. Seven, anyone who does a preamble to the film should know how to stand up, speak up and shut up. Eight, project the film using the correct starting sequence. And nine, well, at last you can sit back and relax, but do be alert for any problem that may arise. Never, never leave the projector while it is running. <laughs> There's one thing more to do make sure, won't you, that it's the right film with the right title and for the right audience. <laughs> That was awesome. Um, yeah, that showed up in a collection of films I got from Rhode Island College. Um, 
bunch of uh, feature films actually on 16. I, I basically they got rid of they had a film department, but they were watching everything on DVD. So they, I basically paid shipping to get all of their feature films. So I have like 180 feature films, none of which are that particularly rare. But you know, if I want to bust out a copy of Bonnie and Clyde that's faded uh, red, I have it and I can watch it whenever I want. <laughs> um, but uh, that was a pleasant surprise. Um, and it's great. I think a lot of film collectors like that film. They like watching or showing films about showing films. And uh, so I figured that was a great way to wrap it up. Uh, I hope we learned something about how to be an AV geek. Um, it is not uh, something you can do lightly, take lightly. It requires a lot of expertise and time and energy. Um, and of course, besides having a projector, you have to have at least one film to show. So, and a take-up reel. Those are the two things you need. Although I have shown a film where the take-up reel fell apart and I ended up emptying film into a tub and then wound the film back on the reel by hand. Um, I think some of us have experienced that doing screenings. Um, it is a rite of passage. Do not recommend it. It is tedious. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming out. Uh, next show, I've pretty much decided that it's going to be about motorcycles on March 11th. So join me. That's uh, daylight savings time for Americans um, in certain time zones. So join me, 8 o'clock, daylight savings time. And uh, we'll watch some more uh, wonderful educational films. Um, thank you to Peter for coming here and filming. And uh, he was the one that gave me the idea, the... Uh, to, to do, I was like, he wanted me to talk about what I do in showing films and about projectors, and I was like, well, why don't I just do a show about how to be an AV geek, and about projectors, and maintenance, and care, and all the considerations associated with it, so it's it's his fault. Um, thanks for those of you that, that hung in, it got a little bit more technical than we normally do, it wasn't a bunch of troubled teens, although, you know, teens could be troubled with a projector, um, yeah. So uh, hopefully we will see you again uh, next month. Uh, there's lots of stuff online. Uh, there's more than 3,000 AV Geeks films online at the YouTube channel. You can go to avgeeks.com and buy DVDs if you like. That's another way you can support us. You can go to Patreon, pa Patreon, God, um, and uh, make a donation there. It can be a small pittance, and uh, any little amount of money uh, is great. It, it, help, it goes towards buying bigger things and doing more interesting things with uh, the collection. So thank you for all of you that, all of you that have tuned in and um, have contributed. Even if you share it with other people, that's a way to contribute. So thanks again, and we will see you again soon. Have a good March. <laughs>